I want to open the afternoon keynote session with Anant Kandadai from Qualcomm. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Who is going to talk about his vision is the new, new wireless. Mr. Kandadai is a senior director of engineering in the multimedia R&D group of Qualcomm in Qualcomm Technologies. He was over te two decades of experience working on speech codec standardization, camera system design, and compu computer vision involving fundamental research as well as commercial implement implementation. He currently leads the computer vision technology de development for Qualcomm, including technology roadmap, use cases, algorithmic, system design architecture, hardware, software development, and customer product development. Hello, uh, my name is Anant, and uh, today's topic, I, we thought we chose a slightly different uh, theme, sort of relating analogies from two maybe not so related uh, topics. Right? Just recently I was asked about, uh, uh, we didn't know Qualcomm was working on uh, uh, computer vision, and uh, I hope you know that we worked on wireless, and uh, this talk, while my main goal is to provide some similarities, uh, it, you can also get from it a little bit of background on what we are thinking in terms of when we say we work on computer vision, uh, why we think we are working on computer vision as a continuation of uh, you know, our work on wireless in terms of changing the world and things like that. So that's sort of the high level theme for today's uh, talk. Uh, just a little bit of a, a, a background, uh, you know, just as we talk about history, computer vision, uh, is, is relatively a very, uh, you know, five decades of very excellent work, uh, you know, continuously evolving. We, ha we had talks earlier today about how even the latest and greatest, uh, you know, um, um, the development surrounding deep learning and things like that can be thought of as sort of a continuity of fundamental uh, vision-related problems that uh, people have been working for many, many, many years now, right? I mean, uh, starting from early days, uh, work on structure from motion, flow estimation, uh, 3D model retrieval, and, uh, and, and so on. In fact, there was a joke uh, among uh, some people who have worked on computer vision longer than I am, as, they, uh, as the introducer introduced me. I've been working on computer vision probably for the last six or seven years, but before that I've worked on signal processing. But people who have worked on computer vision for long have said that uh, for a long time, computer vision people work on problems that have not been solved. Once it is solved, they just move on to another problem, right? So that's one of the reasons why, uh, uh, you know, I think, but today it is changing because there's an intersection of real world applications needing the, all the talents of computer vision uh, technologies and developers. So just a quick thing, uh, I plan to, you know, just like the history was the obvious one, I also want to say, state another obvious one, which is that we're all excited about uh, you know, advances in deep learning and things like that. I mean, fundamentally, from my point of view, it, is, it doesn't look, it is not like it's a new invention. It's even, even the, the, the neural network approach, convolution approach has been old. But I think one of the things that we are re starting to realize now is that putting this kind of approach of machine learning onto a problem uh, has become more relevant now because suddenly the availability of data is much, much larger now. So when you have more data, classic methods of computer vision are not as easy to consume more data. You have to go back and you know, retrain and uh, revalidate and so on. Whereas with, the, with things like machine learning, you can just have an automated system of you know, adding your data every day and the system just does almost the same thing and it just retrains and retrains on optimal, new optimum. So I think when we think about uh, you know, this topic about uh, is computer vision the next wireless, uh, I think you can think about it in two ways. right? One is, is computer vision the next wireless in the sense of uh, ubiquity? right? I mean, we all know computer vision has been there, uh, solving all kinds of automation problems in the world uh, in various um, you know, niches for a long time, uh, solving very important things, right, in, in, in medical imaging as well as in industrial uh, machine vision and so on. But I think the question is, just like uh, communication was 
restricted to point-to-point uh, -point communication where the endpoints were not really moving. But over the last two decades, we have seen that uh, data and voice communications have really become ubiquitous, right? I mean, we are able to communicate anywhere in the world and at any point in the time. The question is, can computer vision also move to a time where we all face computer vision anywhere in the world at any point in the time that we, we need it? So that is one uh, thematic question that we have. Uh, the other question is also is that from from business standpoint, uh, we want something that is the next wireless, right? I mean, among all the other technology areas, is computer vision the next wireless, right? So that's those are two two ways in which you can link. Uh, you can try to understand the the basic title of the talk. Again, continuing, I think uh, we all know that computer vision has always been and still today is. Uh, a problem that requires large amount of computes, right? I mean, basic tasks like detection and, and tracking, if you just go and do the basic uh, calculations of instructions per second that a machine needs to execute, we are talking about, uh, you, know, uh, you, know, uh, you know, a million MIPS and things like that. So that has not changed at all. But what used to be the case, you know, the reason why it has taken, uh, in spite of five decades of very mature technology development, we think it has not reached ubiquity is because the compute power has also not been distributed more uh, ubiquitously. Just to give an idea, uh, you know, I think when we say something has to be ubiquitous, then I think the, 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 the computer vision system or the machines have to see farther and they have to see smaller things, right? When you post the problem that way, it is not enough if, if I, completely solve the problem of object detection that's working on a particular QVGA, uh, you know, 320 by 240 uh, image, even though that problem itself is an ill-posed problem not solved. Uh, and even, even if I get to a desired precision recall on that particular thing, unless you solve the problem of making the object work in the real world, where it has to be seen outside, right? So, f so the, just as an example, uh, I think if you want to, to think about a camera in, a, in an automotive, for example, I think the, the size of your camera or the number of pixels that you pass in to your computer vision system directly uh, imposes the distance at which you can, uh, you know, your failure of uh, detection will happen, and that's going to impose the time you have for the automotive to, 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 to act. Right? Just to give an example, uh, I think uh, at, a, at a car traveling at about 60 kilometers per hour, uh, unless you have about 4K uh, input resolution uh, for the same, for example, pedestrian size in terms of number of pixels, uh, I think you, unless you give it 4K, uh, you, you have four seconds for the car to react. If you have a smaller image, your car has to react just that much faster, right? So in terms, some sense, the complexity of the computer vision system, if it increases, it can actually keep the, the mechanical system and, uh, to, be, to be more contained. Another uh, uh, way to look at it is that, um, actually, so the other important point I want to make, uh, just to go back a couple of slides here. Um, so I think when we talk about ubiquity, we also talk about adding intelligence to the edge, right? So I think the, the right answer is that it's never about is it cloud or the edge, right? The right answer is always that it is both. It's going to be edge and the cloud. But there are some advantages and there are some requirements of end use cases that require intelligence to be added at the, at the edge. For example, uh, efficient use of network bandwidth. Uh, you know, there may be security and user privacy concerns that might, uh, you know, force the use case to have as much intelligence locally as possible. And when I say as much intelligence, uh, I mean, the more you get to the intelligence domain, to some extent, you are go going away from the signal reconstruction domain. So sometimes there are cases where you are, uh, if you move to a domain from which you cannot re reconstruct the original signal back, there's an increased sense of uh, privacy and so on. Uh, and sometimes the reliability and the low latency operation, right? We talked about in the, in the example of the automotive case. Uh, similarly, I think another example we, uh, we want to just pose is that it has uh, doing, mo moving the intelligence to the edge has real economic implications in many cases. For example, imagine uh, you have uh, an in, you know, uh, connected camera in a, in a bus and you want to detect occupancy of the bus uh, for route planning and, and, and even messaging people waiting for the bus and things like that. Uh, 
I think if you send a five megapixel image once every you know, five seconds, and you have some 20 such buses in your fleet, the cost of moving all the five megapixel image to the, to the cloud uh, sometimes can run to about $1,000 a day. I mean, if you do the calculations, uh, uh, you know, th this is just simple, simple math. On the other hand, if you reduce the problem to, to just uh, determining the occupancy at the edge, then suddenly the, 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 the economics are significantly different. That's just a given example of uh, why sometimes uh, you have to move the intelligence to the, to the edge. So the next question is, okay, but we know the computer vision problem has uh, compute requirements, right? That has not changed. You know, that is independent of whether it's something on the edge or on the, on the cloud. But one thing we have seen that is that um, the recent advances in mobile devices, if you track the, the, the compute enhancements that have been made, you know, over the years, depending on when you sample it, we have like 80-fold increase in the compute capabilities that are there on the devices, right? When we say 80, we sort of aggregate uh, all computers, all machines that are available on the, on the mobile device that are capable for computer vision. Your CPUs, your GPUs, your, the DSPs that are there. Uh, the computer vision needs a high RAM, you know, if you want to uh, minimize data movement. I think the RAM is significantly increasing as well. Uh, the, the camera sensors are, uh, photography is actually driving higher and higher megapixels uh, onto the onto the mobile devices. So availability of cameras has also been solved some, to some extent. And the quality of the cameras, uh, I think because they are for the purpose of aesthetic uh, photography, are actually pretty good quality, you know, starting from optics and electro-optics as well. So the other, but you know, these are the, the edge hardware capabilities, but you know, you need to have an ecosystem to make it ubiquitous, right? What made wireless ubiquitous was not just the core technology of the communication efficiencies of sending bits from point to another point or, or creating mobility, but to actually have an ecosystem of services and applications and use cases that need to be developed on top of it. So that is another thing that we need to, to do, and that might involve uh, you know, standardization and having various levels of programmable access to the various computer vision assets that are there, both on the cloud as well as on the, on, the, on the devices. And then, really, when we say ubiquitous, I think we need to bring the, the computer vision use cases and the capabilities to billions of devices, right? So that's another thing that we want to do is to make, bring computer vision to where you are, rather than take you or your use case to the place where computer vision can be delivered. So as I'm not going to spend too much time on this slide, I think from our point of view, we think we have been you know, investing for a number of years in leading the wireless uh, revolution. I think the main thing that we, we talk about this is, again, focusing on change, changing people's uh, lives, you know, going from, uh, you know, today we are shipping you know, more than a billion devices every year. Uh, that kind of scale of shipping computer vision enabled smart devices is what we want to get to before we say, is it another wireless? But that is sort of the, the thinking. The question is not about whether computer vision works in real life, it does, but we want to bring it to, to, um, to, to, the, to the vast, uh, you know, to the, to the eight billion people in the world. For what are we doing? Uh, just as a, a couple of examples, uh, I, you know, we are adding uh, hardware in our chipsets to to do you know, advanced computer vision techniques, uh, not only classical techniques, we're adding hardware for, uh, for uh, performing classical computer vision techniques, as well as for, for deep learning. And our view is that for at least for the next uh, five years, there's going to be a healthy uh, soft handoff. Uh, even if I make the assumption that all computer vision problems, uh, the classic computer vision tasks of you know, detection, tracking, recognition, segmentation, reconstruction, let's assume all of them will be solved by some kind of a deep learning network. Uh, we think that there will be a handoff because one of the biggest problems that, uh, you know, after we solve the, uh, the, we know what networks to train for this computer vision task. Um, we know exactly what network it is. We know exactly what precision recall we can reach. You will still be left with the problem of uh, po optimizing power consumption. So we might have to have hybrid systems that sort of intelligently go from uh, one uh, high frame rate 
uh, you know, slightly moderate accuracy system to a lower frame rate, but more accurate system. The intelligence would be about how you do you mix both of them. So from our point of view, uh, computer vision is, is empowering a broad set of application, right? Computer vision is just an enabler of something. It is not the end. It, it needs to do something. And what is those? From our point of view, we are seeing mobile imaging, uh, virtual reality, augmented reality, connected cameras, uh, robotics, drones, and automotives. These are some of the, uh, the, the things on our radar, if you will. So just to quickly go by one at a time, right? I mean, we all have cameras, uh, uh, you know, and cameras are an important part of our uh, smartphones. Uh, but those, the cameras in the smartphones have their own cadence of getting smarter and smarter, right? I mean, there, it's already a very intelligent system. You know, your basic camera is already, in my view, a computer vision system making decisions on uh, illumination and color and so on. But I think we are going to go towards making decisions based on object and who is there, what is there in the scene, where is it in the scene, and things like that. Um, uh, you know, object tracking for, for example, uh, we talked about three A's, right? Auto exposure, focus, and white balance are as classic three A's of a camera. Uh, we want to m see if we can make an automatic zoom, for example, where the user can, uh, with one camera, uh, simultaneously capture moments in both wide angle and telephoto, where the telephoto is object tracking and things like that. Uh, virtual reality, I think, uh, you know, things like, you know, head post tracking, you know, eye tracking for the purpose of foveated rendering where, you know, uh, one of the fundamental problems we have in virtual reality on the edge is that for you to render a 4K uh, or maybe sometimes 8K at very high frame rates, you know, 90 FPS or 120 FPS, the, the, the pure bandwidth uh, that, that of data that goes on the chipset sometimes drives the temperature up. So we need to optimize it. One of the best ways to optimize is to provide the highest resolution and frame rate only at the direction of the view of the, uh, the, the experiencer. So for that, you need to sort of know where the eye gaze tracking. It becomes a fundamental requirement for you to optimize bandwidth. So it's one of those things where with computer vision, your bandwidth can be 100 times less. Without computer vision, you have to plan for something that is 100 times more. So if you look at it that way, computer vision is not a a uh, little bit of a cherry on top, if you will, but it becomes almost mandatory for you to experience. Uh, uh, even though what you see uh, is not, uh, you know, uh, what the machine sees is not what you see, right? So it's actually an interesting use case. Of course, I think this is an obvious one, you know, connected cameras, both at home, uh, you know, as well as uh, in, in surveillance, professional surveillance areas is, uh, requires a lot of intelligence. I mean, it, it is a, uh, in many cases, it's an always on camera looking at a scene uh, 24 uh, hours, seven days a week, you know, all 365 days a year. And, um, but you still uh, want to catch only the outliers, right? I mean, you're really interested, you have this camera always on because you're interested in the outliers. So you need to make sure that you have very high precision and recall on those and not overdo it. Similarly, on action cameras, right? I mean, people tend to record for a long period of time, even though. Uh, for the later consumption, it's only very sm small number of key frames and key points in the, in the image that they are really interested in. This is an obvious uh, slide. Vision for uh, making cars safer and eventually driving to autonomous is, is uh, you know, I don't have to say anymore. I think it's, a, it's an obvious case for uh, computer vision. And the other thing is about uh, drones. This is something that we have, uh, uh, you know, our Snapdragon chipsets being integrated into, uh, you know, both, you know, some cases, uh, semi-industrial drones as well as uh, commercial, uh, 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 commercial drones for video recording and stuff like that. And uh, it's interesting that people are using computer vision for flight control of the drones, uh, position hold. Uh, you know, fly back to the base before the battery runs out and, and, and things like that, in addition to uh, recording the scene intelligently. So I think uh, to sort of quickly summarize from our point of view, I think if, uh, you know, flying cameras, intelligent cameras, uh, you know, virtual reality and uh, self-driving cars 
all of them happen because the society needs them or you know th those drive behind them the te the fundamental technology that will be driving all of these things to uh, you know large volumes the, the key technology is is computer vision i think without computer vision becoming ubiquitous these are not ubiquitous and if these don't have to become ubiqu ubiquitous then to some extent uh, computer vision doesn't have a use case that needs uh, ubiquity in the sense of personally touching each one of us at any point in the time and any place in the world so just to 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 close uh, we think of course computer vision is a is a fundamental technology that has potential to change the world lots of uh, you know many many decades of research but i think the stars are lining up uh, qu quite quite well in terms of the compute capabilities the 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 use cases that have a lot of vibrance and things like that and so but i think we think that uh, unless uh, the intelligence gets embedded in different points of our life uh, you know i think that is necessary for ubiquitous position for computer vision so in general, I think uh, in summary, I think I would say exciting times ahead. So we certainly hope and we think that uh, among all the other technology areas, the computer vision technology area is the one that I think at least has the potential of saying it changed the world, uh, you know, starting from let's say 2016, 2017, the next decade or two, uh, we, can, I, we hope to say that it changed the world the way wireless changed it uh, back in the 90s. So with that, I stop and... Uh, any questions, yeah.